all right assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam sir all right so today is going to be our third lecture and today i will advance the topic of symmetry forward and we'll start discussing about crystal systems so so far what we've done is we've talked about point groups so ghazi or daud or anyone else could you could you tell me what a point group is and uh, how do we summarize our previous lecture so we have divided different crystals and different molecular symmetries into point groups according to the symmetry elements present in that particular group or structure right exactly so what we've done is we've come up with 32 mathematical groups called point groups which are sets of symmetry elements each symmetry element is either a rotation or a roto inversion mirror planes are included and whenever we have a, a pattern which is called a crystal or a lattice we can have uh, we can ascribe a point group one of the 32 possible sets to each lattice point or to each group of objects that we place at a lattice point uh, and these point groups determine the external morphology of the crystal they determine what the crystal looks like from the outside if you if a crystal belongs to a particular point group say 2 forward slash m then you take that crystal rotate it by 180 degrees you will land the crystal into a self coincident position or you could find a plane a mirror plane that is perpendicular to the two fold axis of rotation and uh, still do that operation and return the crystal in a self coincident form or you could just have a mirror plane inside the crystal uh, and for example if i were to draw a crystal of this kind so i pick up a mineral and the shape of the mineral is of this kind it's like a trapezium then what i could do i could draw a mirror plane halfway in between and this crystal has this mirror plane as its symmetry element just having a single mirror plane as a symmetry element would ascribe this crystal to the mono uh, to the Uh, to the point group two forward slash m, so we've discussed point groups in details, and we've also looked at how do we represent these point groups by stereograms. Uh, each point group has a symbol, and we've seen how these point groups are developed. So we have the cyclic groups, then we add mirror planes to it, uh, then we add rotation axes perpendicular to the original, uh, to the original principal axis. and then finally we have the five cubic point groups which do not have a single principal axis of rotation so all is good so far now what we would like to do today is we would like to take this discussion forward and look at an alternative description of crystals okay and always remember that whenever we discuss crystallography we have to maintain this difference between the concept of a lattice and a crystal a lattice is a set of points which are place holders for atoms or molecules and when you put motifs or basis elements on each lattice point you generate the crystal structure all right so lattices without atoms without the placement of atoms also conform to symmetry rules and when you add motifs 
the symmetry of the lattice can go down or it could remain the same. It depends upon what kind of atoms you add and what symmetry elements do you put on each of the lattice points. So I'll bring home these concepts in, in the lecture today and in the next couple of lectures. So now I would like to look at an alternative description of crystal symmetry, which is compatible with point groups, but it's a fresh way of looking at crystals and it's the more popular and easier way of looking at crystals. All right, so the key idea is the following and let me write it down. The point group of a set of atoms, which is called a basis, placed on a lattice point adds geometrical constraints to the kinds of lattice. Now this is quite a strange sentence that I've written. So let me expound on this. Let me explain this in today's lecture. And this is the gist of today's lecture. This is the central idea that we're going to talk about. Now, in order to uh, understand this further, let's define what a lattice is. Lattice, as you already know, is a set of points. So here I've drawn a lattice in two dimensions, but we really were talking about three dimensions. But for simplicity, let's start with the plane lattice. Now, if I take a point on the lattice, the basic idea of a lattice is that every point has the same environment. That's the key. If, you're, if you are a tiny object and sitting inside a crystal on a lattice point and you look around, you'll see an environment, you'll see some landscape, you'll see some scenery. Now, if you were to sit on another lattice point, you would see exactly the same scenery at exactly the same orientations, exactly the same angles, there will be no difference. So each lattice point is totally equivalent to another. It's coincidental with another, okay? So every lattice point has the same symmetry and that's how we define a lattice. So we, if we are, sitting at a particular point, say here, let me change the color. I could always make a translation left, right, back, forward by certain amounts. And I end up on, an, on another lattice point. I can keep on making translations I can make one translation after the other so I can move forward, then I can move right. I will still end up at a lattice point. Therefore, excuse me. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Therefore, a lattice is defined as a set of points in which are located at position vectors R, where R is given by UA plus VB plus WC. Okay, where U, V, and W, they are integers, and A, B, and C are translation or lattice vectors. Okay, so this is how we define a lattice. So here, A vector is given by a vector starting from this lattice point to this lattice point. And I can keep on advancing in the A direction. Likewise, I can keep on advancing in the B direction and still end up on lattice points. And if I hop from lattice point to another lattice point, the environment is totally the same. I can always make these translational hops through A and B in unit steps, one, two, three, four, plus one, minus one, minus two, minus three, in either direction that is and still end up on lattice points. This is how we define a lattice, okay? And if one were to choose an area or a volume when we talk about three-dimensional 
lattices such that this volume is indefinitely repeated to make the entire lattice and such a volume is called a unit cell. So a unit cell is the smallest self-repeating unit or volume inside a crystal. And if you knew the unit cell, and I'll say what you mean by knowing the unit cell. If you knew the unit cell, you can generate the entire crystal. So it's the smallest self-repeating unit and you translate it in units of vector A, vector B and vector C, you will generate the entire lattice filling up all of space. You will generate the entire crystal, sorry, filling up all of space. Now, what do you mean by knowing the unit cell? So the unit cell is the smallest self-repeating unit. Knowing the unit cell, let me draw a geometrical structure that represents a unit cell, a simple unit cell. Let me draw a cube. Now, when I draw this cube, uh, just remember that I've drawn a geometrical structure and there are eight vertices of the cube. Okay, there are eight vertices of the cube and there's a lattice point at each vertex. So this lattice point is not necessarily an atom. And it's just a point. But for clarity, I've drawn this corner, this edge in a slightly expanded and inflated fashion, like a big circle. So, but these are really points. These are not atoms at the moment. These are points. Now, if I take this unit cell and I were to repeat it, left, right, bottom, up, down, I will generate the entire crystal. So if the crystal can be generated in this fashion, then the cube is a unit cell, okay? So you just have to repeat the unit cell to generate the entire crystal. And what do you mean by defining a unit cell? You need to know some of its properties. You need to know the three, the relative orientation of the three edges of the unit cell, which are denoted as A, B, and C. So this is my vector A, this is my vector B, this is my vector C. So you need to know the lengths of these vectors and you need to know the directions of these vectors. And this will define your unit cell, the geometry of the unit cell. It will define, but that's not all. Uh, you, but, uh, so, so this the geometry of this unit cell is defined by the vectors A, B, and C. So these vectors have some certain directions and they have lengths. The lengths determine the size of the unit cell, whereas the directions determine the shape of the unit cell. Okay, so knowing the shape of the unit cell and knowing the size of the unit cell determines what the unit cell really is. And for that, you need to know the orientations and the lengths of the unit cell vectors, A, B, and C. All right, so far, so good. Now, when we talk about symmetry elements, we are not really concerned about the size of the unit cell. The size of the unit cell doesn't matter as far as symmetry is concerned. Of course, the density and other properties of the crystal do matter, but as far as symmetry is concerned, you can well imagine that the size is immaterial. The symmetry elements determine the shape of the unit cell. All right, good. So, so far, so good. Any questions? Quite a simple concept here. Now we have 32 point groups. The point groups put constraints on the shape of the unit cell. Now, this is such an important statement. I would like to write it down. 
point groups constrain the shape of the unit cell. Okay, now what does this mean? Let me give you a few examples. And this is the topic of today's lecture. And it emerges that if we were to look at all the possible shapes of unit cells based on the 32 point groups, which define all crystals, then only seven kind of shapes of unit cells are possible, only seven. And those are called the crystal systems. Examples, the simplest point group is just one which really means no symmetry at all. So this does not put any constraint on the unit cell, which means I can draw a, I can draw a unit cell with arbitrary, sorry, with arbitrary A, B, and C, arbitrary lengths, and in arbitrary directions. There is really no constraint whatsoever on, on the shape of the unit cell. By the way, let me also define the angles. It's important to define the angle. So if I have unit vectors A, B, these are unit cell vectors A, B, and C, I can define the angles in the following fashion. So the angle between alpha and A, a and B is Sorry, something. Just wanna there's something going on with my screen today. This angle is denoted as gamma. This angle could be denoted as alpha, and this angle could be denoted as beta. All right. So if there's no symmetry constraint on the uh, on the imposed by the point group, which is just the point group one, I can have a unit cell of arbitrary A, arbitrary B, arbitrary C, arbitrary alpha, beta, and gamma. So there's no constraint on the shape of the unit cell, which means that A, which means that A need not be the same as B, need not be the same as C. And alpha need not be the same as beta, need not be the same as gamma. I can be, I can have six degrees of freedom. I can choose each A, B, and C, and each alpha, beta, and gamma independently of one another. This gives a totally arbitrary shape of the unit cell. Likewise, for the other point group, which is the next in line, one bar, which means that each lattice point is a center of symmetry. Now this can be satisfied also by any unit cell, any unit cell whatsoever, with no mutual constraint on the unit cell ve vectors or the angles or the interaxial angles, satisfies this property that every lattice point need be a center of symmetry or a center of inversion. So when we have these point groups one and one bar, it put constraints on the unit cell and the constraints happen to be that there are no constraints for this for these two point groups so this shape of the unit cell which emerges from these point groups is called a triclinic unit cell so a triclinic unit cell has no constraints on the axial vectors their directions or their mutual lengths or the relative lengths okay so let's look at another example to bring home the idea in a, in a better fashion. Let's consider the point group two. Now the point group two has two elements. It has the identity and it has a two-fold rotation. So let me draw a two-fold rotation axis. Okay. Now suppose uh, I have a lattice point
here and this is my origin here suppose i were to draw so there's a lattice point here and a lattice point here and these are connected by a vector a which defines one edge of the unit cell now by the definition of of lattice points if i have a vector at a i must also have a, a lattice vector lattice point at a i must also have a lattice point at minus a because this is how we've defined lattices yeah this is how we've defined lattices if v and w are zero u could be 1 it could be minus 1 could be plus 2 could be minus 2 i will still end up at lattice points therefore by the very definition of a lattice if i had a lattice point position at a i must have a lattice point position at minus a okay now this comes out of the definition of a lattice now does the two fold axis of rotation seem to be compatible with this requirement for a lattice that's the question if i were to do a two fold rotation about the axis that i've drawn will i generate from a a point at minus a yes or no yes sir no it's not it's not possible you see if i were to do a two fold rotation of this point here i will end up here oh 3d mein yani dekhne mein thoda sa main differently dekh raha tha therefore it will not result in a point at minus a okay the only way in which this can result in in a point at minus a would be the following that is if i have a two fold axis of rotation and i have some plane which is now don't consider this to be a mirror plane this is just some plane perpendicular to the two fold axis of rotation and then if i were to have a point anywhere on this plane at a vector a only then would the two fold rotation create a point at minus a agreed so this means that so can you repeat the last thing that you said now i i've given that in the point group 2 i have a two fold axis of rotation let's call that axis of rotation let's denote it by the symbol c okay so it's a vector pointing out of the plane of the paper now if i were to take a point a the two fold axis of rotation would have a certain operation on that point it will rotate the point through through 180 degrees if it can okay but then there is another definition for a lattice that one needs to satisfy and that definition is that corresponding to every lattice point at point a there has to be another equivalent lattice point at point minus a okay so if i were to draw two ve a vector then i need a lattice point also at the diametrically opposite side but that is only possible when the two points which are a at a position vector a and minus a are in a plane perpendicular to the c axis had i points anywhere outside this plane so if i had a point here the 180 degree rotation would produce a point above this plane rather than producing a point below the plane which is the requirement of the a minus a pair so does this make it clear kisne sawal pucha tha yes sir afnan aapne pucha tha yes sir can can you please uh, confirm if you really understood this yes sir i asked because um, most time to our center and cuz there was a masla that aapki awaaz clear nahi aayi thi but yes i understand okay good okay so the requirement for a two fold axis of rotation necessitates that the lattice vectors a 
are in a plane perpendicular to the two-fold axis of rotation. All right. Okay. Likewise, I can take another point. If I would, now I need three lattice vectors, A, B, and C. Okay. So I could take another point B, position vector B inside the same plane. And the twofold axis of rotation, which I have, which is my starting point for the discussion, will convert B to minus B. And there is no constraint on the relative angle between A and B. Got it? A and B, they can't be coplanar vectors because these vectors have to be different, but there could be any angle gamma between A and B. All right. But the C vector has to be perpendicular to both A and to B. So therefore, this puts the constraint that alpha has to be 90 degrees, beta has to be 90 degrees, and gamma is arbitrary. And there is no constraint whatsoever on the relative sizes of A, B, and C. So I could now draw a unit cell which is compatible with the point group two, which is just a lone two-fold axis of rotation. And that unit cell could be drawn in the following fashion. So this is A, this is my B, this is my C, and there is no constraint on the relative sizes or lengths of A, B, and C. Furthermore, this angle, which is beta, has to be 90 degrees. This angle, which is alpha, has to be 90 degrees. Whereas this angle, gamma, is totally arbitrary. It could be 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 100 degrees, 91 degrees, so on. It could even be 90 degrees, accidentally. But there's no constraint on the angle gamma. And there's no constraint on the relative sizes of alpha, beta, A, B, and C. So this lone two-fold axis of rotation, which is one point group, puts a constraint on the shape of the unit cell. And this unit cell it gives this second crystal system. We've seen the triclinic crystal system. This gives us the second uh, crystal system, which is called the monoclinic system. So the monoclinic system, the unit cell is defined by these geometrical properties of A, B, C, alpha, beta, and gamma. All right. So any questions about this? You can get the same. Now, if, if I were to look at the other, uh, the next point group in line, which is just a mirror plane, just a mirror plane. Okay. Then exactly the same shape of the unit cell emerges from the existence of this mirror plane. Which means that if I were to choose a point above the mirror plane, Something wrong going on with my screen at the moment. So one point, suppose, is on the mirror plane. And I draw an arbitrary point, point A above the mirror plane. Then by the requirements of the lattice, I must have a point at minus A. But the mirror plane does not allow us to have this point. Because what the mirror plane gives us instead is a point over here. So this, if this were point A, this were a point A prime. But we really need a point at minus A because of the requirements of the lattice. Therefore, the vectors A and B must be inside the mirror plane. So here is vector A and the vector B could be somewhere else, but inside the mirror plane. But 
the vector c could be anywhere however it has to be perpendicular to the mirror plane all right so this puts exactly the same constraints that i've drawn over here monoclinic alpha beta must be 90 degrees whereas gamma could be arbitrary and there's no constraint whatsoever neither the mirror plane nor the two-fold axis of rotation put any constraint on the relative lengths and sizes of a b and c they can be totally arbitrary this is the monoclinic crystal system in fact the third point group two forward slash m which is the two-fold axis of rotation followed by a mirror plane which is perpendicular to the two-fold axis of rotation also puts the same constraints on the monoclinic unit set. So if I have the point groups 2 or m or 2 forward slash m, all three of these point groups are compatible with the monoclinic unit cell. They put the same kind of constraints on the shape of the unit cell. And this kind of unit cell renders the crystal into a class which is called monoclinic. Okay, so, so we've seen the triclinic class and we've seen the monoclinic class. Okay, and the defining property of the monoclinic crystal system is that it must have a two-fold axis of rotation or a mirror plane or both. All right. Uh, and... And saying that, uh, so it could have a two-fold axis of rotation or a two-bar axis of rotation, which is equivalent to a mirror plane. So triclinic means, if I were to draw tri triclinic, it means there is no constraint on the shape of the unit cell. Sorry, I'm having some problems dealing with my screen at the moment. It could have a symmetry operation one or one bar. These two point groups are compatible with triclinic. A, B, and C could be arbitrary. Alpha, beta, and gamma could be arbitrary. Monoclinic. Has a two or a two bar axis of rotation. it could it's compatible with the point groups 2 2 bar and 2 forward slash m and the shape of the unit cell is such that gamma could be arbitrary but alpha and beta have to be 90 degrees okay so this is the monoclinic class all right so, any questions up to this point? Sir, the triclinic is our group. Hai. So, can it cover the entire... First, my brother, triclinic group is not a It's a triclinic class. All right. Sir, the triclinic class can cover our entire space, ko cover kar sakti hai, provided that it has an arbitrary shape. Hai. Ji, it can cover it. So, is there any restrictions that they will be stacked up with the elements? Yeah, they will stack up with them and they will get a crystal. Mil All right. Just imagine a big, a big unit cell, a really big unit cell. You can hold it in your hand. It's, it gives you the entire shape of the crystal. It's very much possible that you hold a crystal in your hand. It does not have any symmetry whatsoever. Mm -hmm. All right, sir. Take it. So the point groups, which are symmetry elements at each point, operative on each point, those symmetry elements render certain constraints on the shape of the unit cell. And seven shapes, possible shapes emerge. And we've seen two of them, the triclinic and the monoclinic. 
if we go, were to go a step forward and we had two perpendicular two fold axis of rotation or two bar two bar axis of rotation then a new shape of the crystal emerges so if i were to draw two two fold axis of rotation which are perpendicular to one another can you imagine what kind of constraints does it pose so the first uh, the one that I've taken, the first axis of rotation tells us that vectors A and B, so suppose this is vector C. So the first axis of rotation tells us, first of all, as we've seen in the monoclinic class, that vectors A and B must lie in a plane perpendicular to C. So they must lie in the AB plane. So if I were to draw a plane, in here which is perpendicular to c let's call this the a b plane vectors a and b must lie in this plane however this second axis of rotation also puts constraints on the relative angles between vectors a and b it tells us that a must be perpendicular to the vector b so having these mutually orthogonal two-fold axis of rotation leads us to necessitating that all angles alpha, beta, and gamma must be 90 degrees. But it doesn't put any constraint on the relative and on the relative unit cell vectors, A, B, and C. Their lengths could be arbitrary. So this from this emerges a new crystal system which is called orthorhombic. And if I were to draw the orthorhombic unit cell, all three angles are 90 degrees. And there is no constraint on A, B, and C. And all three angles are 90 degrees. Alpha, B, sorry. This is the orthorhombic unit cell. Okay, now I could add additional symmetry elements, keep on adding them, going from one point group to another, and still see if these constraints change. It turns out that for certain point groups, the constraints don't change. They result in the same crystal system. As we've seen in the monoclinic, all three of these point groups, two, two bar, and 2m forward slash m, all of them are compatible with the monoclinic class. Likewise, I can see, let me bring out another description here. So here you, you can observe that the point groups 2m and 2 forward slash m, all three are compatible with the monoclinic class. For the orthorhombic class, I observe, by the way, by the way, here, if I have two perpendicular axes of rotation, it necessitates the creation of a third two-fold axis of rotation. Okay, so two symmetry operations lead to the third one automatically. So in the orthorhombic system, if I were, have, if were, I were to have the point group two, 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 which means three mutually perpendicular two-fold axis of rotation, I will get the orthorhombic system. Now, if I were to replace these two-fold axis of rotation by two mirror planes and have a two-fold axis of rotation as well, I will still get the orthorhombic unit cell. Likewise, if I had this point group in which I had three two-fold axis of rotation with mirror planes perpendicular to each one of them, I will still get the orthorhombic crystal system which means that the constraints are 
alpha, beta, and gamma, all three of them are equal to 90 degrees. And A, B, and C could be arbitrary. So let's look at this 2 for M, 2M, 2M. So if I were to draw this, uh, the symmetry operation, this is what it's going to look like. I have three two-fold axes of rotation. One along A, one along B, the third one along C. And then I have mirror planes perpendicular to each one of them. Okay, so these three mirror planes perpendicular to a two-fold axis of rotation is the point group two forward slash m, two forward slash m, two forward slash m. And if I had these symmetry operations, so at each lattice point, I have a collection of atoms or some objects which satisfy this point group, then this would lead to a unit cell which has the shape of a monoclinic it will lead to the monoclinic shape of the unit cell, which means all three angles, alpha, beta, and gamma have to be 90 degrees, but there is no constraint on the, uh, on the relative sizes of, of the monoclinic, uh, of the unit cell vectors. So you got this point. So we've seen three crystal systems now. We've seen triclinic, we've seen uh, orthorhombic, and we've seen monoclinic. Any questions, my friends? So likewise, if I had a four-fold axis of rotation, so, so sorry about the screen, it's just behaving slightly hayward today. So if I have a four-fold axis of rotation, I get a unit cell with different kinds of constraints. So let me draw a four fold axis of rotation. Now, can you just predict what kind of shape of the unit cell does this necessitate? Uh, does I think two sides, two sides will become equal and the third exactly. one. Exactly. So if I were to draw a unit cell of this kind, in which these sides A and B are equal and C could be arbitrary, but the angles are all three of them are 90 degrees. So alpha, beta, and gamma, all three are 90 degrees. A and B are equal and they could be unequal to C. Then this kind of unit cell is called tetragonal. Okay, and if I go here, the tetragonal unit cell is compatible with all of is compatible with all of these point groups: four, a four bar, four forward slash m, four two two, four m m, four bar two m, four over m, two over m, and two over m. So I keep on adding symmetry elements belonging to the different point groups. That is, I assign point groups to each point. All of these point groups will not put extra constraints on the tetragonal shape of the unit cell. The tetragonal shape will remain tetragonal. You will remain inside the same crystal system. All right. So the tetragonal unit cell is really like a cuboid or a parallelepiped in which two sides are equal 
and they could be unequal to the third side. By the way, if you perform an experiment and measure these lengths A, B, and C, that's what you do in an X-ray diffraction experiment. Accidentally or within the bounds of error, C could turn out to be equal to alpha, A and B, but that's just an accidental degeneracy. All right, so now let me come to, uh, so we've seen triclinic, we've seen monoclinic, we've seen orthorhombic, and we've seen the tetragonal crystal systems. So we've seen four of them. Now, if we would like to uh, look at the, let's look at the cubic crystal system. Now, if the system has four threefold or three bar fold axes of rotations, then it puts a constraint, a hard constraint on the shape of the unit cell. And the constraint that it puts is that your unit cell needs to be a perfect cube. So if there are four threefold axes or four three bar fold axes of rotation, then A must be equal to B, must be equal to C, and alpha, beta, and gamma, all three of these angles must be equal to 90 degrees. And I can draw these th threefold axes of rotation. I've already draw drawn them in a previous class. So here comes one of them. Here comes another of them. Here comes yet another one of them. And here is the fourth one of them. All right, so you must be surprised that a four-fold axis of rotation is not necessary for, for the cubic crystal system. So we've seen five uh, crystal systems now, uh, which are the easiest to understand, and two of them are yet to go. So if I look at my table here, and I've already uploaded this document on the on the website. I hope you're all following the website. I'm going to upload a homework today as well. So here comes the cubic. Uh, crystal system. The cubic crystal system has is compatible with five point groups T, TH, O, TD, and OH. And if you observe, each one of them has a threefold axis of rotation. So T has eight threefold axes of rotation. Uh, so eight means four threefold axes of rotation and four three bar fold axes of rotation. Each one of them has three fold axis of rotation, right? Which I've underlined. So the presence of a three fold axis of rotation and S6 is also a three fold axis of rotation followed by, a, by an inversion operation. That's called S6. So you can observe in the international notation, you can observe that the three fold axis of rotation are along the body diagonal, which is denoted by the symbol in square brackets one, one, one. And we're going to talk about these. So here are the locations of the threefold axis of rotations in a, in a cubic crystal system. So sometimes the international notation gives you a better view and sometimes the Hermann Manguin or the old notation gives you a better view. Anyway, so the presence of a threefold, four threefold axis of rotations necessitates a shape of the unit cell, which is cubic. You got it? So the point groups lead to the seven crystal systems and they're mutually compatible with one another. By the way, you can also start looking at the crystal systems and infer what kind of point groups are compatible with it. You can do it the other way around as well. And both of these approaches give you identical results. Now, I would like to briefly talk about the two uh, remaining crystal systems. So any questions in the meantime?
so the hexagonal so let me do all both of them together the hexagonal and the rhombohedral rhombohedral by the way is the more most confusing I, i'll show later why the hexagonal crystal system now i'm going to just write down the requirement for a hexagonal system it has a six fold or a six bar fold axis of rotation and what this does is that it puts a constraint that the, the constraints that it that, that it puts is that alpha and beta must be 90 degrees and gamma must be 120 degrees a must be equal to b but not necessarily equal to c so if i were to draw this unit cell here is what it's going to look like two sides are equal a and b are equal 120 degrees is the angle so this is what the crystal system looks like c is arbitrary and this angle is 90 degrees and this angle is 90 degrees if i were to stack put three of them together three unit cells together i will generate if i look at it from the top i will generate a hexagon sorry i have slightly so this is the hexagonal unit cell okay and this point or any any lattice point any lattice point is a six fold axis so if i were to draw a six fold axis of rotation any lattice point gives me a six fold axis of rotation okay so this is a hexagonal unit cell and it's a really important <laughs> crystal system the rhombohedral is is a, is a strange unit cell in this unit cell all three sides are equal and all three angles are equal but not necessarily equal to 90 degrees okay and this is defined by a three fold axis of rotation or a three bar axis of rotation so i could draw a rhombohedral i'll try drawing a rhombohedral unit cell and you can look up the web on on prettier pictures so all three sides are equal and all three angles are also equal and the three fold axis of rotation lies also along the body diagonal all right so this is the these are the seven crystal systems uh, and i would like to invite any questions about these crystal systems so let me try bringing up a picture of uh, of the seven a better picture of the seven crystal systems so we can't seem to be able to do that at the moment Oh here it is. Just a minute. Oh here you go. So cubic, rhombohedral, hexagonal, tetragonal. orthorhombic monoclinic and triclinic 
and each one of them is compatible with point groups, with certain point groups. And here is a table for that. Okay. Now, <coughs> notice that in rhombohedral, you can just have a single threefold axis of rotation. The cubic system has four threefold axis of rotation. And the rhombohedral is distinctly different from cubic. Okay. But by the way, the rhombohedral system is the most confusing. And there's a lot of uh, debate on whether we, we should use the rhombohedral system or the another system which is called the trigonal system. And this, but this is a technical debate. I'll see if I can cover this debate. Uh, but any questions about the seven crystal systems? Uh, sir? Yes, Ali. Uh, sir, you mentioned uh, the lengths of the side can be arbitrary. I mean, the, the numerical value of the lens can be arbitrary. Which which crystal system? I mean, for all crystal, crystal systems. Yeah, it's a relative lens that is important. That is determined by the uh, point groups. But but if I make the lens arbitrarily small, uh, then there won't be any distinction between whether it's a, a cube or a a tetrahedral or anything else. But why do you I want mean, to make it arbitrarily small? I mean, uh, I mean, my point is there is there has to be some constraint on the length that they, they should be large enough so that we can distinguish between uh, two shapes. Of course, of course, these lengths are finite. Whenever you have finite lengths, you can always distinguish between these platonic geometrical structures. Yes, okay. I mean, I mean you, you mentioned they can be, I mean, any lens you want. So I was confused about that. They have to be finite. They mean, otherwise you can't, you will never be able to, you run into Zeno's paradox, you will never be able to make a crystal of macroscopic size. Yes. Okay. All right. So, by the way, now I'm going to talk about some really interesting idea. And that is, there are 32 point groups. I've lost my, okay, here you go. There are 32 point groups compatible with these 32 point groups. There are seven crystal systems. By the way, you need to remember the names of these crystal systems and with experience, you'll also remember the constraints on the shape of the unit cells. It, it's nice to go home and you're already home, by the way, and that's why you're angry with us, but you need to have, you need to be outside this class. You need to draw these crystal systems over and over again and get the feel of these crystal systems. That will really help. So you have seven crystal systems. Now, is that all? No, it's a strange question, is that all? A lattice is a set of points in which each point is indistinguishable from another. Can I add more lattice points or can, to these seven crystal systems? Can I make these crystal systems somehow more complicated and still preserve the point group operations? That's the question. So for that, I need to understand the concept of centering of crystal systems. And there are different kinds of centering. All right. So if I have, so let me draw. So if I were to draw a crystal system, say a cubic crystal system or a tetragonal crystal system or an orthorhombic crystal system. And if I just look at it from the top, what I'm really doing is doing a projection. So here I have a projection of this crystal system onto the base axis. So here is the basal plane. And I'm just projecting the contents of the unit cell onto the base. Now, if I were to just have a single point on all the four vertices of this unit cell, how many points do I have in a unit cell? Question. Eight. Eight, okay. 
so my daughter is standing next to me and she's also saying eight but eight is not the correct answer because this unit cell is being shared with eight neighbors okay there are eight neighbors to this unit cell आगे पीछे ऊपर नीचे राइट सो ईच यूनिट सेल इज बींग शेयर विद एट नेबरिंग यूनिट सेल सो रियली ओनली एट टाइम्स सो देर आर एट यूनिट सेल्स एट पॉइंट अपेरेंटली ऑन यूनिट सेल बट देर आर एट नेबरिंग यूनिट सेल्स एज वेल तो द belonging the sense of belonging to of each point to a unit cell is is just one so there is one point per unit cell really okay so if i were to talk about a unit cell there is only one point in it okay and that is at the location 0 0 where 0 0 represent the locations on the a b and c axis okay so we say that such a unit cell is non centered it does not have any centering or it is primitive now don't use the word primitive in the medieval sense this is a is a proper terminology it's a p cell a primitive unit cell which just has one point per unit cell but we can have other kinds of of centering as well now the other kind is that suppose i draw a, for simplicity let me draw a cube just for simplicity there is nothing special about the cubic system even though the cubic is very popular because it's somehow easy to understand thanks to plato and our biological evolution alisa then is very fond of biological evolution all right so this is a cube now if i had i just need to draw only the points that belong to this unit cell so if i had sorry excuse me sorry a point here of course there are points at the other vertices as well but i just suffice to draw the points that belong to this unit cell i could have another lattice point these are not atoms i'll place atoms later i'll worry about atoms later by the way these are just points even though i'm showing them my balls or spheres i can put another point at the exact center of the body of this unit cell now this second point that i've drawn belongs exclusively belongs to the unit cell so i have two points per unit cell and this kind of centering if i look at the projection i can draw a projection one point at the vertex and the other point in the exact center but at a height one half above the unit cell so i have two points per unit cell and their fractional coordinates remember the use of this word fractional coordinates are 0 0 and half half and half because i need to walk half units of along a half units along b and half units along c and half means half relative to the length of the unit cell so i move half a plus half b plus half c to arrive at the other lattice point okay so this kind of centering is denoted by i but it's called body centered and i is probably the german word for body centering in enzentrierte okay so i have primitive centering i could have i centering likewise i could have face centering sorry in face centering so let me now draw all the points uh, i have a point here at the vertices i'm 
taking the liberty of drawing all the points, by the way, again. And then on each face center, on the center of each face, I have another point. Front, sides, bottom, top, back. And there are three points per unit cell. Sorry, four points per unit cell, sorry. Four points per unit cell. Just a minute, let me try fixing this. Four points per unit cell. And if I were to draw a projection of this so-called F centering, I need to specify the fractional coordinates of the four points. One of them is of course at the edge. One is here, one is here, one is here. This is at a height one, this is at a height half, and this is at a height half. And the fractional coordinates of these four points are zero, 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 half, half, zero, half, zero, half, and zero, half, half. So by the way, this is how we represent what are called fractional coordinates, locations of points or atoms inside a unit cell. Okay, so I have P centering, I have F centering, I have I centering, and I can also have other kinds of centering in, for example, So suppose this is an orthorhombic unit cell. In the orthorhombic unit cell, I can have what is called C centering in which, suppose this is my C axis, in which only the basal planes, they have, uh, they have a point in the exact middle. So if I were to look at a projection of a C centered, orthogonal cell, I'll get a point at the edge and a point here at height zero. Here, this one. This, so the coordinates of the two points are zero, zero, zero and half, half, zero. And of course, there is a point here as well because this is a lattice translation. It puts an identical point and there are two points per unit cell because this point belongs to this unit cell by a fraction of one half because it is shared with another unit cell. And this point also belongs to the original unit cell by a fraction of one half. So this gives a total of one point and one point comes from the edges. So the C-centered orthorhombic also exists. Now, if we look at, if we now combine the centering with the crystal systems, cubic, can be primitive, body-centered, face-centered. Orthorhombic could be P, I, F, and C. It has all four point, four kinds. Triclinic, hexagonal, rhombohedral. They can only have the P centering. And monoclinic, can have P or B. So what does B centering mean? As you know that mo the monoclinic unit cell, if I were to draw the monoclinic unit cell, an arbitrary angle gamma here, arbitrary A, arbitrary B, arbitrary C. So this is my A direction, this is my B direction, this is my C direction. So if I were B centering means that 
this face has a point at the center and this face has a point at its exact center. All right, so these kinds of centered units, so let's count the number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Have I mixed something? Yes, I mixed tetragonal. Tetragonal is P and I. So it gives us 14 kinds of centered unit cells. And these are called the Brave lattices. All right, so, so we have 32 point groups, we have seven crystal systems, and we have 14 Brave lattices. Now, is this making sense? Question, I have a question. Why can't we have a C-centered cubic cell? Why can't we have a, an F-centered hexagonal cell? Why can't we have a C-centered monoclinic cell? Why can't we have an F-centered tetragonal unit cell? Why can't we have a C-centered tetragonal unit cell? How do we answer these questions? Why do we have just these 14 Brave lattices? Why doesn't each one of these crystal systems have primitive body centered, face centered, and C centered or B centered? Why are these just 14? Why don't we have seven times four, 28 kinds of Brave lattices? That's the question that I would like to leave you with. So, for example, if I were to ask you the question, why don't I have a face centered tetragonal? How do we answer this question? Let me draw a tetragonal and let me do it properly. So a tetragonal has two sides, which are equal. Possibly unequal to the third side. And the question I would like to ask is, why don't I have a face centered tetragonal? Or say, let's see, why don't I have a C centered tetragonal? Let's do a face centered, let's attempt a face centered tetragonal. So let me draw the points. P is allowed. So I need to, I, I'm attempting to do phase centering of the tetragonal. And my wish is that first of all, when I do phase centering, I would like to maintain the properties of a lattice the resulting structure should remain a lattice. That is each point has the same environment. Okay. The other thing is that if I add centering to it, then I must remain inside the same crystal system. I should not jump out of the crystal system and convert a tetragonal to an orthogonal because that's going to change the symmetry. That's, that might change the point group of the, of the crystal. So I need to remain inside the same crystal system. So if I attempt to do phase centering, let's see what happens. I put an at a point here, a point here, point here, the point here, and a point here, and a point at the back. Now let's see the impact of this. The impact of this is the following. In order to see whether this is allowed, I draw a neighboring tetragonal unit cell. And 
I draw at one at the front, but I'll draw that later. So if you look at this point here and you imagine the environment of this point, it has points above and below, which are seen at angles of plus 45, minus 45, plus 135 and minus 135. So likewise for, for this point, it has, it sees a certain environment. But what about this point that I've drawn with a tick? Does this see an identical environment? Does this point at the base see an identical environment? If I'm standing at the point A, I move at 45 degrees with respect to the north by a certain distance, I'll end up at another lattice point. Does that happen with the point B or with the point C? Yes. If I... No, it doesn't. Does it? I mean, I have to specify the north direction and move 45 degrees. Oh, oh, C axis. C axis. Okay, okay. Yeah, the C axis, yes, it does. It does see an, an identical environment, doesn't it? It does, correct? So I generate a lattice, but is the second property satisfied? No, it doesn't because I can generate a new unit cell. Of this kind. So if I look at the unit cell that I've generated with these orange sides, isn't this a new unit cell? And isn't it also tetragonal? And isn't it one of the 14 Bravi lattices? Isn't it a P tetragonal unit cell? Yes, it is. And we've already covered, we've already accounted for primitive tetragonal unit cells because we've claimed that tetragonal could be of the P kind or it could be of the body centered kind. And when we attempted to construct an F-centered tetragonal cell, it turned out to be exactly giving rise to a P tetragonal cell. And that's already accounted for. That's one of the 14 Bravi lattices. So I'm not generating a new Bravi lattice here by attempting to face center the tetragonal. So the F-centered tetragonal unit cell doesn't really exist. We would like to keep the number of points per unit cell to a minimum for simplicity, to expound the entire point symmetry of this crystal and so on. Okay, so we've already taken into account primitive tetragonal unit cells and phase centering does not lead to anything new. Therefore, we do not have an F-centered tetragonal unit cell. And in the homework, I'll ask you more questions. Why can't we have a C-centered cubic cell? Why can't we have a, a, a body-centered hexagonal cell? Okay, why can't we have uh, a, a C-centered monoclinic cell? Okay, why can't we have a body-centered monoclinic cell? And so on. Therefore, centering is allowed, but only 14 unique Brave lattices are formed. Okay, so we started off with 32 point groups we immediately notice that those 32 point groups are compatible with seven crystal systems. Then we try to center these crystal systems and can only create 14 Bravel lattices. Okay, which preserve the point groups by the way. So this is how the entire body, the entire paradigm of crystallography without discourse to actually placing the atoms at the moment. We haven't yet placed the atoms inside the crystal, though we can. But that will lead to additional symmetry elements and we'll have to discuss space groups at that point, which is going to be the lecture, uh, the in point of investigation of the next lecture. So I'm trying to uh, upload, I'm trying to prepare a homework, which I've already done. I have to type it up and I'm going to upload this uh, hopefully today. It's going to be due next Thursday, inshallah. 
So any questions about today's lecture? So yes, nothing, will, nothing will go on LMS. I'm not going to use LMS. I'm going to use my website. And everyone I would request to be on, on the Google group. So I'll put everything on the website that I've already mentioned in on fizzlab.org page. Okay. Sir, is there some text we can refer to for these two lectures? So I'll try to find something that is really relevant uh, and to the point. But it's basically these lecture notes that you need to follow and do the homeworks. And I couldn't find all of this material in such a succinct fashion in, in, in a single textbook. There are long texts on crystallography, but I'm sure you would not like to read them. They are very terse, very tedious, very long. But I'll try to find some resources that can help you. But do look at the handouts that I've already uploaded on the website about point groups and, and the homeworks I've constructed are specially meant to get you through all of this. All right, sir. Thank you. So any more questions? All right. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, friends. Inshallah, we'll see you on Tuesday. Good out.